Now the next programme begins with extraordinary recordings dating back nearly 70 years. The voices. The voices. On the record. On the records. Which you are about to hear. Which you are about to hear. Uh, of people who are known. Are of people who are known. To be. To be. What we call dead. What we call dead. I'm you Walker. And you Walker. You are. Is that it, sir? Is that it, sir? I have been brought here by the Reverend Dr. Kirchhoff. Please make the matter public that I will preach again. I wish you, in this great movement, I wish you all success. Stop recording. We present What Grandad Did in the Dark. Three granddaughters search the ether for their grandfather, Noah Zerdin. Okay, Tanya, this is um, the house that Noah moved into in 1932. And um, we're about to go into my bedroom from when I was 0 to 12 years old. Okay. And after I moved out of this room, um, they told me, Mum and Dad said that he used to do his psychic seances in here. Yeah, it's tiny. And fairies on the wall. <laughs> That's all I know about it. <laughs> I'm the oldest of the granddaughters and none of us met him. He died before all of us were born. He died in 1972. I knew that he came over from Russia when he was pretty young. And I know that he had quite a thick, strange accent and that he used to laugh so much when he was telling a joke that he could never finish the end of his jokes. But I do remember knowing that there was a book in the bookshelf at home that was written by Noah and never wanting to take it out of the bookshelf because I just thought it would scare me a lot. I knew that his first wife died when she was young, when my when my dad was about seven months old, and I was vaguely aware that there were a couple of rooms in the house that I thought were spooky because I didn't used to like being in the dining room on my own, doing my piano practice and things when I was a child. I really have always just had this kind of need to know what goes on when you die. I also want to know more about what my grandfather did. So I'm really, really interested in finding out more. We began our search by questioning our parents. Judith, a journalist, interviewed her father, Dan, Noah's son. So, Dad, how did Noah end up in England? He left Russia in 1906. It was soon after Bloody Sunday, which was the first stirrings of the revolution and uh, he, he came to London and eventually started up his own business as a farrier in Oxford Street. So when did he get involved in spiritualism and why? Well there was this awful fire at his premises in Oxford Street in which he lost his wife, my mum <coughs> and uh, it was almost immediately after that. The Evening News, April 8, 1927. Hundreds watched a fire today at the premises of N. Zerdin, a Russian furrier's. The flames quickly took hold of the upper floor, and two girls appeared at the window on the second floor, which was by this time well alight. They were shouting for help. One girl got safely onto the ladder, but the other seemed to get nervous. She ran backwards and forwards in the room with her clothes alight. Mrs. B. Zerdin jumped from a second-floor window and was caught by a man in the street. Her clothes were almost burnt off her, and her condition is serious. What was it like growing up with Noah Zerdin as your father, then? There were always seances held at home. Uh, I can't remember a time when there weren't. I was very young, when I, I my early recollections... Uh, I would be put to bed, but through that, that door, I used to hear music. Weren't you supposed to be in bed? Yes, I was, but uh, I was curious and I was also scared. <laughs> so I used to come and sit on the landing at the top of the stairs and just sort of listen. And always at the end, they always closed with 
an Irving Berlin song called The Russian Lullaby. It was Dad's signature tune. How old were you when he started telling you about it? He probably started telling me about it when I asked where my mummy was. Naomi and I, Tanya, are both students. We quizzed our mother Ruth, Noah's daughter. I'd really like to know what Noah did in the dark. When did you actually find out what they were doing? Well, it wasn't a question of finding out so much as just part of life. When I was little, I used to think that Florence Nightingale and Sir Oliver Lodge and Arthur Conan Doyle were my dad's friends. So I suppose I found out things by just being around, and it was just part of everyday life, because there were seances held at home, and I thought that was quite normal. So you said that he was looking for the truth. Well, what was the truth that he was looking for? That there was survival after death. That he could prove that there was survival after death. Why did he want to prove that there was? When he was married to Bertha, they talked about. My dad was an atheist at the time. He'd grown up in an Orthodox Jewish family, but he'd he'd actually become an atheist. But they used to talk about, you know, whether there was anything after death. And I, and my understanding was that they had decided that whichever one went first, that they, they would try and make contact somehow. At an open voice circle after one evening service, a woman communicator spoke to a man in the group. She said she was his first wife, who had been burned to death in a fire at their factory. The success in reaching Bertha in a home circle gave Noah a reason to broaden his research onto a grander scale. It became an all-consuming quest to provide evidence of life after death in the public arena. It was quite recently, actually. I would.、Um, My mum took me upstairs and showed me some really old newspapers, and、um, I read all about the old experiments and stuff. I didn't realise that he was so important. As we write these lines, there are eleven clear days before the meeting. The body of the hall has been filled, and yet applications for tickets still arrive by every mail. The doors will be open at six thirty p.m. and the meeting will commence at seven p.m. sharp. At seven thirty p.m. All doors will be closed, and latecomers will not be able to get in. Those arriving by car can park their motors in the car park in Hanover Square, which is close to the hall.、Um, Dad, where does this hall fit into Grandad's story then? Well, the Aeolian Hall was, in fact, a concert hall, and Dad decided to hire it and hold a public demonstration. Of what was called then, and it was quite new in those days, a direct voice. In other words, the voices do not come through the medium. In other words, they're not using the medium's voice and sort of making it sound peculiar.、Uh, but these are independent voices using the, the power emanating from the medium and from various sitters to talk. There was a, a small nucleus of people in the hall, the immediate circle. And、uh, the rest of the hall was filled with members of the public. If the Aeolian Hall could speak, it could tell of the many great musicians who have kept audiences spellbound with their wonderful music. But of all the stories it could tell, the most fantastic one would be the story of how six hundred people heard the dead speak to their friends and relatives, telling them that they are not dead but very much alive in some place which they called the spirit world. To make sure that the large audience was not dreaming or suffering from an attack of mass hallucination, the voices were recorded on gramophone discs. Wasn't Noah worried that he might be ridiculed? I don't think he was ever ridiculed.、Um, he met scepticism, certainly. You know, concerned friends were worried about him being taken in. Were these mediums merely clever tricksters producing funny voices? Where was the proof he talked about? They were all legitimate questions, but I don't think anyone has been. Convinced of survival without his own bit of personal proof, Dad took a lot of trouble to safeguard himself from anything like that. And with mediums like Leslie Flint and, and Mrs. Perryman, he sat with them or had them in his own home circle a number of times before he let them loose on a, on a big public meeting. And he was convinced of their genuineness. And he well, he wasn't an, an idiot. He wouldn't have been taken in. And as far as the Aeolian Hall meeting itself was concerned. It was an independent company that placed the microphones around and made the recordings. So I don't think there was any question of trickery there. Well, you see, the 
that's the trend. And that, you know, the, the, really, the circumstances in which it's been all this time, and uh, the, the trunk is completely, completely hidden. I knew he had a whole lot of stuff here, somewhere, but I never actually got around to uh, looking at it. Well, I, I, I come into the garage pretty often during my life, um, and I always knew that this corner of the garage was where the psychic things were kept, so I never really ventured over here. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get to it, we have to move this thing out of the way. Um, <clears throat> there's, um, there's a lot of piano music here, which belonged to my mum, which has been here all these years. And in this, this black wooden chest, <laughs> underneath all this, um, there are copies of the Link magazine, which was the magazine which he produced which chronicled the, the doings of various home circles. And, uh, of course, most important of all, this great collection of acetate records, which uh, were sitting there, or rather standing up, not covered at all. Each disc was, was bang up against the next disc, and all in a paper carrier bag. Pre-war paper carrier bag, I may say. And... They must have been there, well, they were made in 1934, so they must have been there ever since then. I don't recall Dad ever playing them, and I haven't heard them yet, because I'd completely forgotten all about them. Well, I'm Phil Farlow. I've got a uh, private audio transfer business, which I do institutional work for National Sound Archive, BBC, a lot of museums, and uh, we do all sorts of things with sound in this room, at least we've got the specialised equipment to deal with the original discs and tapes, etc. Even more so with acetate discs, which were the early form of private recordings. There it goes on the turntable. And with any luck, we should have some sound here. Suspense is killing. to introduce this unique set of records is both a pleasure and a privilege. I, I have a terrible feeling it's uh, my dad. It has been said that dead men tell no tales. But on April 28, 1934, 560 people who were present at the Aeolian Hall, London, listened in amazement to the voices of the so-called dead, speaking independent of any physical instrument or human voice. Forty-four separate and individual voices spoke from space through a microphone and by means of loudspeakers were held by all present and were at the same time produced on the set of records you are about to hear. Well, that is quite extraordinary. I had no idea that he recorded that sort of introduction, setting out exactly the thing. I mean, you, you couldn't have asked for anything better, really. It's, uh, it's absolutely clear, and I, I'm quite astonished by this. Really weird. I never thought I'd hear his voice. No, I never heard his voice before. That's pretty cool. All the edges are lifting on these. Mm. They're, they're not going not gonna to survive many more takings, ins and outs. I'll just about get that, I think. There is no death. There is no death. It is merely a change of clothes. It's merely a change of clothes. 
Merely a change and nothing more. As you are able now to switch on your wireless, the day will come. As you now switch on your wireless, so the day will come. Then you will be able to switch on to that long distance telephone. When you will switch on that long distance telephone. That long distance telephone who love you waiting to hear the call. To those who love you, waiting to hear the call. I am Dr. Coulthard. I am Dr. Coulthard. These are good recordings, you know. They are, aren't on they? The, in this particular format. Yeah. Unknown female, this one. Do we do this? I don't want him to forget the past. I don't want him to forget the past. I want him to still remain as he always was. I want him to still remain as he always was. Our boy. I don't want him to be spoiled. I don't want him to be spoiled. You know what I mean. I do, yeah. and we'll hear My you. dearest love to him. My dearest love to him. I want him to know that I am with him often. And I want him to know that I am with him often. God bless you, dear. Oh, I must go. But God bless you all for the power which you have given me tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. God bless you all for the power which you have given me tonight. Now this one says play, play them backwards. Yeah, you might get my regards to Mr. What's his name? Third, and that's it. Tell him his wife's there, sends her kindest love to him, and don't give up this ship. It ain't gonna sink, see? Well, what's on the other side? Right, let's have a go. Mm -hmm. Mother, it's Bertha. Noah, it's Bertha. If you can hear me, here's the answer. My love to you, Mother. I love to you, Noah. I can hear you. I can hear you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sweetheart. Hearing the moment when Bertha spoke to Noah from beyond the grave was really quite startling. Well, let's try this one. All right, then. There is only one key. There is only one key. In which you can undo the door of psychic understanding. With which you can undo the door of psychic understanding. The simple key of love. The simple key of love. It unlocks the door of the other life. That unlocks the door of the other life. I pray now. I pray now. That I can do much more from this side of life. That I can do much more from this side of life. Than I did on the earth plane. Than I did on the earth plane. And then lastly on this one, we've got Henry and Harry. Or Henry or Harry. Yes. <laughs> and or. Hello, Leonard. It's Henry. <laughs> I'm Henry's my sister-in-law, and I'm Harry's my brother-in-law. <laughs> to my brother, rather. Henry to my sister-in-law, Harry to my brother. And I hope with all my heart but the link will be much more progressive in the future. All the finest mediums we have ever had have originated from the home circle. God bless you and further the cause of the master. Further the cause of the master. Is that what he said? Yes. Of the cause of the master. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Because he, he sort of summed up the goal of the home circle, which was to develop mediumship so that the message could get across. And this is why Dad formed the association of, of home circles, so that they could link up. But there were a great number of home circles dotted all around the country at the time. We've got the lacquer starting to flake from the edge here, which is typical of this kind of vintage of disc, and so we're going to have to pick it up just about there. A peculiar sensation uh, at the back of my neck. It seemed to come both from the back of my neck and my throat. That's, that's Mrs. Perriman, that's the medium. She was the medium for the great experiment, and uh, she apparently had incredible powers. Voices sometimes could be heard I in broad daylight. She was a formidable medium, and I'm sure that is her 
explaining what happens. Can you imagine uh, a tooth being drawn? Yes. Most peculiar sensation. Your voice is hoarse now. Well, I suppose it's because I've been without my larynx for so long. Fascinating. Never heard it before. In the meantime, Tanya and I did some homework. Naturally, it was decided we should look on the internet to see if we could find anything out about Noah. So I typed in Noah's Urgin. I'll do it now. Let's see what comes up. Here we are. Look at this. There's his name. There's his name. My God. OK, and it says the Noah's Ark Society information to form society to promote and develop physical mediumship. Wow, look at that. Wow, with Noah... Noah's Ark all going up in wonderful fire like the phoenix rising. I can't believe this whole site is dedicated to my grandfather. It's implying that he is continuing his work from the other side. This means that Noah's been in touch with these people after his death. There's an email address. I think we should email them and say, Hi, I'm Noah's granddaughter. See what they make of that. <laughs> There was a seance held in Leicestershire. A voice spoke and claimed to be that of Noah Zerden. George Cranley is the president of the Noah's Ark Society. A voice came out of Bidair, which everybody heard, and said he would like them to start a society for the safe practice of physical mediumship. This appearance by Noah Zerden was completely unexpected. And as a result of that, we formed an organisation called the Noah's Ark Society, named in honour of Noah Zerden, because it was discovered that about 50 years, almost to the day, prior to the date of the seance, he had founded the Link of Home Circles. And so it seemed rather fortuitous that he should return on that particular occasion. According to the website, that was in 1989. So did he ever appear again? I was at a seance when a voice claiming to be that of Noah Zerden spoke in Hull five or six years ago but he merely said that he was very happy with the way the society was going and that it had exceeded all his expectations but why did he do what he did when he did well at that period in the 1930s and latterly the 1940s there was tremendous interest in spiritualism i feel even more so in the 40s because of the number of people who passed over due to the second world war it aroused a great deal of interest but in the 30s, there seemed to be a number of mediums who were advertising their services. And uh, Mrs. Perryman was one. Leslie Flint was developing at that stage and was coming along nicely. And um, a few others. So it seemed to be a period of preparation, if you like, for the war that was to come. We decided that if it was possible to make contact then, it ought to be possible now. Could we speak to Grandad? George recommended a direct voice medium in Sussex, Colin Fry. We sat in complete darkness in a wooden pavilion in his garden, whilst Colin invited the other side to speak. Come on. I can understand now why I used to get so chastised when I used to move around so much. I'm trying to sit still. Well, this is a turn up for the books, isn't it? For me, the most convincing voice to come through was that of Leslie Flint, who I'd met when he was alive. He was a medium my dad Noah had worked with a great deal, so we asked if he knew who we were. Of course. Otherwise I wouldn't have made the effort. <laughs> 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 Members of a family were so influential in my own life. This man gave so much, and he was nobody's fool. Well, I've got to say, I don't think I would have ever evolved into the medium that I'd become if it hadn't been for him. It enabled spirit to touch the lives of, I dare say, thousands. Mm. That's what I find encouraging, you know. Mm. There's young people here. Yes. The young people that want to hear the stories of a silly old dead man. <laughs> Then we heard another very faint voice. My name is Noah Zerdin. Mm. <laughs> Your mother in particular has asked me to send her very, very, very deep love to you. 
I can't begin to tell you all how much emotion I feel of being able to speak to you. I move around you and watch you and I'm aware of certain things that happened in your diary. Now that you've opened the box, I'm afraid it's rather like having opened Pandora in a box. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yes. An extraordinary thing. No. What I'm, hope, what I'm hopeful of is that if this is broadcast over the airwaves, people will come forward and say, oh, but guess what I've got? The truth from the past will inspire the truth of the present. And hopefully on the next occasion, the ones that are present might feel brave enough to say, Hello, Grandpapa. <laughs> <laughs> it's like now. Hello. Hello. I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced. I think I'm a little more confused now than I was before. I'm not really sure what to believe in, but I think there probably is something after you die. I'm not too sure what it is, but I do have a greater belief in it than I used to. Well, I was, at the beginning of it, I was, I was probably a bit more open-minded than I am now. <laughs> Especially when I was, when I told various friends about it. It was just really difficult to say that my grand, what my grandfather did, without them looking at me, thinking I actually am the granddaughter of a complete madman. So, I'm not sure. I don't think it's a question of being convinced or not convinced, or believing or not believing. It's a, a silent knowledge that I know that there's something there and I'm fine with that. Whereas maybe even a year ago, I would have been afraid to ask questions or afraid to pull that book out of the bookshelf that Noah had written. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm very happy and I'm very proud to be part of Noah's family. His ambition was to bring the truth of survival to the multitudes and he thought it could be done through the radio and that's why he had recordings made in the hope that they would be played on the BBC. And now they are. <laughs> and now they are. And now, farewell, until we meet again. God bless you. Stop recording, stop recording, stop recording, stop recording, stop recording. What Grandad Did in the Dark was produced by Chris Eldon Lee and was a Culture Wise production.